We're live. All right. Welcome everyone to Good Medicine Way here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Beautiful day out today. Uh, low 50s. I was out there sunning myself a little bit today. It's been great. Uh, but it looks like our, our folks are back on. Maybe I got uh, rescued here. So Preston, if you're ready, you can uh, take over from here. I just welcomed everybody. Thank you, Casey, and thank you back. I was, we had to hold for 10. And thank you again, thank you, 10. Um, first, all you theater nurses, I know you needed that because when you need those theater times to say that you are gonna be holding, you're like, we thought we were supposed to start. That can cause anxiety for some people, especially me. So um, again, thank you for coming. Uh, we have a great speaker again tonight. Um, I welcome you from, again, from my hometown. So from Tavu, New Mexico, and also from the Napa Reservation. And so again, uh, gives you a little bit more of my background uh, since I have never introduced my parents before. So again, I gave you the English names and I haven't given you my Navajo name, I don't think on this channel. So one of these days I'll give you my Navajo name. It's a little bit disrespectful to give your parents the Navajo names for future and current events. So don't plan on ever asking for my parents and my Navajo names. Um, again, we love having you here. We love having, seeing you here and being able to join us and on something new and different and growing with us on this whole contextual events. Um, especially when it's growing. Let's, <clears throat> Can someone please tell me what's next on the list? My downloads uh, is not showing on that yet. If you can just do our opening prayer and then okay. and then Heather will be next with the creation insights. Thank you. Heather you brought it up for me. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we breathe with you. We take a deep breath and it reminds us you breathe life into us. You calm our hearts, calm our mind. Allow us to be one with you. And remind us that the, the pace of love, the pace of walking with you in love is only three miles per hour. Slow our hearts from the busyness of the day. Slow our minds and let us calm, be able to calm our minds to three miles per hour and be able to remember ourselves so that we can be able to open our minds, open our hearts and be able to hear ourselves and hear our hearts beat together. Together with you and also our hearts beat will be, will be breathing as one while we're learning this whole brand new thing that we're putting together. <sighs> Heavenly Father, thank you for the breath. Thank you for the calming. Thank you for this beautiful day that you allow us to have and so many teachings that we are able to learn from it. Let us be able to calm our hearts, learn one more last thing, and what is done is done. What is not done is not done. Let it be. Let us be restful for the upcoming and the ending of the day. Amen. So,
Hello, uh, my name is Heather. Um, I'm here with the Creation Insight. Um, this past weekend, I was actually in Santa Fe for the weekend, and it was more of a retreat with uh, my work, um, InterVarsity. So it was interesting because I was just being reminded of the history and all of the things that have happened there and understanding the past more, I would think more in the, knowing more of the truth, I should say, because it helped me understand what to pray for better, especially in the Pueblo area. And so I realized that I was in the Okeowinge Pueblo area. That was originally Santa Fe. Well, they're originally <laughs> there first, then it became Santa Fe. Um, and it's a really nice town and it's very artistic. Um, and I just realized, I was like, wow, the Okeowinge people took care of Santa Fe before it was Santa Fe. And all those buildings and all those things were not there at all. And to understand how much development has cost us nature is very alarming. Um, and it's very, No, more of just alarming than anything else. So, but at the, and then at the same time too, there's a trout and a lot of the cacti were actually dying when I was out walking around, just praying. And so then I just realized, I was like, wow, it's really, there's a lot of uh, nature dying out there, especially the pine trees where Preston lives because the droughts have made all of the trees look yellow and, it, and they're pine trees too. So they shouldn't be turning yellow at all. Um, so that's just the reality of what is happening now, especially when it comes into terms of water. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that and understand how much the creator loves us all, that um, we are still able to get the things that we are getting right now when other things are not, when other uh, life is not getting the same needs their needs met as well as humans. So that's one of the things that I noticed this weekend. And I'm glad that I did because it really does help me understand um, how much indigenous knowledge and people are needed at the table of the creator. Uh, we could all be sitting in a circle too <laughs> on the ground because uh, between us and there's, there's a deep relationship between us and the earth. And when people don't acknowledge that or understand that, um, bad things really do happen. So just wanna put that out there and let you think about my words <laughs> and thank you. Thank you, Heather. That was so beautiful. And that reminds me of um, the woman at the well. Uh, as we have such great stories of even native versions of when we teach the women at the will, especially to the students. So one of those days, when hopefully one of the students can come over here and teach that because when we teach it, it's a total different thing. It takes about a couple days. Um, next up, we're gonna have uh, this week in the Native American history from the Grovers. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> So um, last week, uh, the Witherows spoke a little bit about the, uh, the massacre at, at Wounded Knee. And uh, another uh, event uh, in Native American history that is kind of connected to that um, is the ghost dance. So we wanted to talk a little bit about that uh, this week. Um, and uh, John was like, hey, we should talk about the ghost dance because Robbie Robertson did a song about it and you should play it. <laughs> um, and so Robbie Robertson, he's this uh, Mohawk guy who uh, was most well known um, as the leader of the group, the band uh, in the 60s and the 70s. And then he had a, a resurgence uh, in the late 80s and early 90s uh, as a solo artist. And... Uh, and in the mid-90s, um, he was involved 
with a large uh, group of people, large group of natives um, who were doing a soundtrack for a uh, documentary that was on TV that was um, about uh, Native American history and kind of st telling the story of history f more from the perspective of natives than uh, from the perspective of white academia. And that was really kind of the first time that uh, Robbie Robertson had really um, done any music that was significantly connected to his native heritage. Um, and one of the songs he did for that um, was um, about the ghost dance. Um, so I'll let his song speak for itself mostly, but in case you're not uh, familiar with the ghost dance, it was a uh, a movement among natives that started in the last quarter of the 1800s um, usually credited with starting with uh, uh, Paiute, is that how you say that mm -hmm. right? Paiute? Yeah, um, and uh, uh, they had, a, one of their elders had a vision um, about uh, a way of doing things and a dance that they could do and a uh, changing of their lifestyle that would um, bring back the the land to restoration, uh, would bring back the buffalo. Um, and part of that was also um, seeing the white people leave the continent. Um, and so because of that aspect of it, it was often interpreted by the white colonizers as a threat, um, even though nonviolence was a huge part of the, the ghost dance movement. Um, so it's really just the, the colonizers kind of projecting their own way of doing things um, onto uh, the, the native folks. And uh, Kimberly just reminded me that is uh, Wovoka, is that how you say that? I believe so. Well, welcome. Yeah, it was a Paiute who was the uh, the first one. And then it was like one of his sons or his grandson um, carried it on later in, in the 1800s. Um, and uh, famously, Sitting Bull uh, was um, uh, an adherent of, of the ghost dance. Um, and that was part of the thing that led to the uh, massacre at Wounded Knee was the government was trying to prevent uh, the Lakota from having a ghost dance ceremony um, because not only did they see it as a threat because they didn't understand what was going on with it, even though there was lots of people, there was lots of uh, anthropologists and different people who were studying it who were telling uh, folks that, no, this has nothing to do with violence. Um, it's just all about living in harmony and finding peace and restoration and bringing back the land and creation to health. Um, but the, the government wasn't buying that, nor most of the white population. Um, and, and yeah, so the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs had a policy of um, discouraging ghost dance, if not in some places it was pretty much outlawed. Um, and that's was one of the aspects that that started uh, the the series of events that led to the massacre at, at Wounded Knee. But really, the ghost dance is all about connecting to your heritage, connecting to living in balance with creation. Um, the The ghost idea is all about connecting with your 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 ancestors and connecting with what was lost, so that you can understand how you can restore it. Um, and so that's what, what the, the movement was, was really about. And it, after the massacre at Wounded Knee, um, it was put down pretty hard and it kind of, um, uh, went into the background a little bit more, though it was still practiced by some people. Um, and there was a resurgence of interest in it, um, in the sixties and the seventies of the 1900s. Um, nearly a hundred years after it first began, um, as part of the, uh, the AIM movement and, um, and all the kind of resurgence of, uh, native pride and heritage that, that happened during, during that time. Um, so that's just a real brief 
uh, uh, history of the ghost dance. Um, there's lots of information about it online if you want to look it up. And, uh, and then I will uh, give a shot at doing this Robbie Robertson song, and I will let it speak for itself. Okay, so Kimberly, she's always great for awesome information. Um, oh, okay, so Kimberly said that uh, the official policy of the U.S. government was to outlaw all Native religious practices, not just the ghost dance, but any kind of Native religious practice. And that order was not rescinded until 1978. Um, but, you know, people persisted uh, despite the despite the government. And the song actually talks a little bit about that. All right, so let me get everything. I'm going to put the words up so you can see them. And uh, we'll get everything switched over. Crow has brought the message to the children of the sun for the return of the buffalo and a better day to come. Now you can kill my body and you can damn my soul for not believing in your God and some world down below but you don't stand a chance yeah, yeah. against my prayers yeah, yeah. you don't stand a chance yeah, yeah. against my love yeah, yeah. they out loud the ghost stands but we shall live again I shall live again. My sister above, she has red paint. She died a wounded knee like a latter day saint. Hear the big drum in the distance, blackbirds in the sky. That's the sound that you hear when the buffalo cry. But you don't stand a chance yeah, yeah. against my prayers. Yeah, yeah. You don't stand a chance yeah, yeah. against my love. Yeah, yeah. They out loud the ghost stands. We shall live again. We shall live again. Crazy horse was a mystic. He knew the secret of the trance. Sitting bull, the great apostle of the ghost dance. Come on, Comanche. Come on now, Blackfoot. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Shoshone. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Cheyenne. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Arapaho. You don't stand a chance. Come on, Lakota. Against my prayers. Come on, Dene. You don't stand a chance. Come on, Potawatomi. You don't stand a chance. Come on, stand here against my love. Yeah, yeah. They out loud the ghost stands. But we shall live again. Yeah, yeah. We shall live again. Yeah, yeah. We shall live again. Yeah, yeah. We shall live. Again. Yeah, yeah. We shall live again. 
We're just going right into our other songs. Sorry, I sound probably all reverby while I'm trying to talk. Um, <laughs> so our next one is, uh, since we're going into the uh, more traditional holiday week, um, this is a, uh, kind of a little mashup we did uh, back when we uh, celebrated the um, actual birthday of Jesus. Um, so it's kind of a mashup of Jonathan Miracle's We Are One, The Little Drummer Boy, and Away in the Manger. So uh, hopefully you can figure it out. perspective and integrated more of his kind of faith journey with it um, where Robbie Robinson's was more historical uh, this one is more um, current I want to 
want to go where the blind can see. I want to go where the lame will walk. I want to see the sick ones clean. Where the deaf can hear and the silent talk. So where are we going? and offering if you would like to donate to the work of Good Medicine Way right there at the top of our Facebook group it says where you can donate on PayPal and as far as announcements and people can gear them up on the Zoom chat or Facebook if you have any uh, the one I'll do first is that this Wednesday and next Wednesday there will be no uh, women's circle we'll just uh, start back up the first Wednesday of 2022 and uh, as far as Good Medicine Way this is our last regular gathering of the year. The 27th and January 3rd will be uh, story circles. So if you have a story, song, or poem, or some artwork you'd like to show and explain, we'll, we'll take turns and go around, and that will be December 27th and January 3rd. All are welcome. All right, and before we move on, just want to open up the floor for a minute. If... Uh, anybody had any uh thoughts comments insights or whatever uh regarding any of the creation insights or the this week in native america stuff the the ghost dance stuff or the creation insights that heather shared uh momentary opening the floor if anybody wants to toss anything out looks like it's up to you all right then, so we'll go into the reading of Creator's Words, and uh, this week we're going to uh, jump out of our regular reading where we were, and we're going to uh, read the uh, story of the Incarnation <laughs> okay. from the, it's, small. it's up there, from, uh, Ooh, there you go. this was actually the first thing that Terry 
Wildman actually ever wrote when he started doing uh, contextual native translation. So this was like the thing that led to the First Nations version. And uh, Leah's going to read a little section out of that. This is from the bit where, um, uh, let's see, the angel Gabriel has already told Mary that she's going to give birth to the Messiah. And then Mary goes to Elizabeth's, her cousins, and Elizabeth is amazed. John the Baptist in her womb jumps for joy. And Elizabeth says, how is it that the mother of my Lord is coming to me? And Mary, her bitter tears, was full of gladness, and her words flowed out like a song. From deep in my heart, I dance with joy to honor the Great Spirit. Even though I am small and weak, he noticed me. Now I will be looked up to by all. The Mighty One has lifted me up. His name is sacred. He is the Great and Holy One. Her face seemed to shine as she continued. He shows kindness and mercy to both children and elders who respect him. His strong arm has brought low the ones who think they are better than others. He counts coup with arrogant warrior chiefs and puts a headdress of honor of those on those of a humble heart. She smiled, looked up to the sky, and shouted for joy. A few months later, at night, in fields Sheep herders were keeping watch over their sheep. Suddenly a great light from above was shining all around them. A spirit messenger from Creator appeared to them. They shook with fear and trembled as the messenger said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will be for all nations. Today in the village of much loved one, a great chief has been born. He's the chosen one. The messenger continued, This is how you will know him. You'll find the child wrapped in a blanket and lying in a feeding trough. Suddenly a great number of spirit warriors appeared, giving thanks to Creator, saying, All honor to the one above us all. And on earth let there be peace to all who stay under the shadow of his wings. When the spirit warriors returned to the world above, the sheep herders said to each other, Let's go and see this great thing the Creator has told to us. So they hurried to the village of Chief Much Loved One and found the child just as they were told, lying in a feeding trough. They left with glad hearts and began to tell everyone what they had seen. All who heard their story were amazed. The sheep herders returned to their fields, giving thanks to the Great Spirit for the wonders they had seen and heard. Bitter tears kept all these things hidden in the medicine pouch of her heart and wondered, what all this would mean. Thank you, Leah. That was very interesting story. Uh, um, so, Casey, can you introduce our speaker? And all right, thank all you, Preston. Yeah, uh, our speaker tonight, uh, our our relationship doesn't go back very far, but it, when it did start, it began very, very deep and very intense. So we, we'll, we've grown, grown together a little bit at, on this walk. And when I first um, heard of him, it was through a, a friend, uh, Kelsey John. And then uh, that connection led me to Gene. And Gene was, uh, he was the Dean of Students over at Indian Baba College, and I'll let him tell his story if he'd like to. But uh, from that time on, we grew a little closer and closer. And, and to this day, Kimberly Medicine Horn and myself are gonna be working with him and uh, other committee members for his uh, theological doctorate. So he'll introduce that as well as what he's working on. And, he chose us because he wanted some contextual people. He has come a long way in his understanding of contextual ministry and really has a heart for, for it. He's, uh, even though he's non-native, he just really believes that there's a, there has, something has to be done to correct what was done in the past. And hopefully through his work, uh, many will have some changed minds and the ministry towards native people will really grow and prosper. So I want to give it over to Gene right now and let him share with us. 
Big way, bro. Thank you, Uncle. Um, I uh, want to start by by saying a few thank yous. Um, first of all, I want to thank Brian for putting together the um, the banner for tonight. Um, uh, when I I just gave pretty much the title <laughs> uh, of of what I was going to be speaking on, and when I saw the banner, I'm like, man, he he clipped in like really right away to to um, what the the heart of what I'm going to share is, is about. Um, uh, and uh, and so thank you for that, Brian. I appreciate that. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, that I'm coming to you from Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, and that is the traditional land of the Indi, Western Apache, uh, Hopi, uh, Pueblo, and Hohokam indigenous peoples. And I want to express my gratitude for their stewardship of this land um, that I am working and living on now. And um, I just want to say thank you for that. And also thank you to all of you for uh, allowing me to share tonight. I'm going to try and uh, there's, there's much in my heart um, and on my mind and I'm going to try and take it slow or else I'm gonna talk really fast and probably just kind of overshare. <laughs> so I'm gonna take, uh, I'm gonna take it um, really slow um, because I know I'm still relatively new to the community here. Um, and want to start by saying that uh, I'm originally not from Arizona. Um, I'm originally from Pennsylvania. In fact, I grew up uh, about 70 miles away from Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Yes, that Carlisle. Um, and interestingly enough, even though I grew up so close to it, I don't remember hearing anything about the, the boarding school that was in Carlisle, much less the, the atrocities that took place there, um, which grieves me. It grieved me when I found out. Um, that I was so close to something like that and, and knew nothing about it. Um, in a manner of speaking, uh, where I grew up was, uh, is, a, is a land of ghosts. Um, in other words, um, there's, there's no reservations around um, where I grew up. Um, I grew up in a very small town um, between, almost right in the middle between Reading and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And um, a little town called Myers Town, named after a German settler named Isaac Meyer. Um, but before it was named after him, it was called Topahawken Town because of the Topahawken Indians of the, the Lenape tribe that um, lived on that land. Uh, I grew up um, floating down the Topahawken Creek. Uh, I, I knew of the Susquehanna River. Um, these are all place names, and it's what remains of the, um, the, the memory of the native peoples that lived on that land. Um, and not, uh, also not something I grew up really either paying attention to or learning about. Um, so uh, to, to come full circle and, and be uh, led um, by creator to come to Arizona, and that's really how we got out here is submitting to creator and, and how he was leading in our lives. I'm married, I have three kids. So it was our family together, uh, kind of discerning that, especially my wife and I. Um, and we packed up and uh, moved across the country uh, about uh, two and a half, almost three years ago now um, to Flagstaff. And um, the, the Lord opened the door for me to, to learn about um, the native ancestors that took care of this land and to work among um, and with their descendants. Um, first at Indian Bible College um, and um, now uh, among you and we keep in touch with, with some folks here in the Flagstaff area and, um, and with the Sacred Circle of One as well. Uh, and continuing to learn, I'm still very new um, to um, to, to the just knowing the people and uh, kind of was in that position that we hear a lot of um, mainstream white Americans are in where they think that uh, Native Americans are, are gone, that they don't still exist, but then discovering that no, they are still alive and well and uh, have endured despite what, um, what our Anglo-European ancestors tried to do uh, as far as um, 
assimilation and um, and um, introducing disease and controlling and taking and taking land and stealing and those kinds of things. Um, and that's really where I wanted to uh, share my heart um, tonight was uh, really having discovered very quickly uh, as we prepared to move out to, to Arizona and as I prepared to work among native, native staff and students at Indian Bible College, um, that there is still um, the perception of Christianity as the white man's religion. And um, that, uh, that bothers me, continues to bother me, um, because of what we'll talk, what I'll talk about in a few minutes, as far as knowing the cultural coordinates of the gospel story, right? Um, and just as a preview, the kind of a spoiler alert, um, knowing and being okay with the fact that the gospel story did not take place in an Anglo-European setting, right? Um, and and being good with that, being okay with that. And that really started with um, going to seminary uh, in Myerstown, actually right across the street from where I grew up is Evangelical Seminary. That's where I earned my, my MDiv and where I'm, I'm working on my, uh, my THD. Um, but it was there that I was introduced to uh, Bible teachers who made this concept very clear to us. Um, I, I, at first, I, I'd grown up in the church, so I was familiar with the Bible. I'd gone to private Christian school for uh, about 10 years, the first 10 years of my grade school. Um, and so the Bible was a very familiar thing. Um, but especially the Old Testament um, was still very foreign. And on some level, I, I believe that it, there, there was something wrong with me that I didn't understand it. I wasn't putting in the work or, or something. Um, and then when I got to Evangelical Seminary and I sat under the teaching, a wonderful man who's now passed on, his name is David Dorsey, who lived in Israel for a time um, and taught, he taught that the Old Testament is not a piece of Western literature. It was not recorded in the English language. It doesn't even follow the thought forms of a typical Anglo-European novel. In order to understand the Old Testament, he taught, you have to understand the cultural hallmarks uh, in which that body of literature first emerged. And that is an ancient Near Eastern, a Semitic culture, right? Um, whose primary mode of communication and, and storytelling was oral, oral storytelling. And so part of the reason why I wasn't understanding it is because I was still approaching the Old Testament with this mindset that I should be able to follow the Old Testament the way I follow my fiction novels that I'm reading, right? The plot should feel the same. The plot points should work the same. And Dr. Dorsey is very, very clear and, and kind in telling us that that's not the case, right? We have to, if we want to understand the Old Testament, we have to understand it um, through its Semitic cultural forms. I, I think Terry Wildman actually talks about this or, or, or mentioned something very similar in one of the promotional videos for the First Nations version about getting into the, to the mind of, um, of an ancient Near Eastern person. Um, and the, that carries through into the New Testament uh, to understand the thought forms and the, the storytelling hallmarks of that particular culture in order to understand what they would have heard and how they would have heard it. Um, that was my first introduction to that concept. And so on one hand, I felt relieved um, because it, I, I, it, it wasn't just me. Um, there was a good reason why I wasn't understanding it the way I thought I should be. But in the back of my mind, there was this growing sense that if scripture is anchored in this non-Western thought form and culture, um, then what do I do with all of the anglicized versions of Christianity that I have been exposed to? How do I wrestle through that? Um, what do I do with that? And my seminary journey um, uh, led me along a, a path that 
that took me eventually to to my PhD work, which is in contextual theology, and and that's what I I'd like to start by sharing. Um, so I'm going to share some. I'm going to share uh, my screen for a moment. Um, I used to think, by the way, I used to think that I I wasn't fluent in a second language, and I was thinking about tonight, and I I learned that I am fluent in a second language, and that second language is um, white academic speech. So if I fall into white academic speech, please jump in and stop me, um, because that's not my intent. It's just it's so uh, it's so ingrained in me. That's where I go, and that's also where I go when I'm nervous. Um, because I'm so used to it. So, um, so let me share um, my screen with you and, and just walk you through what is um, what is contextual theology and what does that have to do with what we're going to be talking about. So, contextual theology is. The study of the relationship between the universal principles of the Christian faith and the way those principles are understood or expressed in particular contexts. A contextual theology differs from what we would call systematic theology in the, in the sense that systematic theology picks a particular principle or particular topic and follows it. What does the Bible have to say all throughout scripture about this particular topic? And then what do early church leaders have to say about it and later church leaders. So what does Augustine have to say about salvation? And if you don't know who Augustine is, that's fine. I'm just saying that he's an early church father. Um, but then later, what does Martin Luther have to say about salvation? You know, that kind of what I would like to describe as a topical study on steroids, which has been the, that's been the bar that's been set for theological studies in higher education for decades if not centuries but contextual theology says that's not a bad study but how are those principles and those concepts actually expressed in the everyday um, how is theology lived out in a particular context and that context is made up of things like uh, like different languages and and thought forms and and culture whether that be religious culture or the culture of everyday life. What about history and how that particular culture has interacted with the groups around it or with the wider world? Um, this is, uh, there are other things there, but those are the, the main hallmarks of when we say context, that's what we're talking about. So contextual theology says, how do Christian principles get lived out within a particular context, right? Now this, leads us to the the gospel we believe that the gospel that that story that that god saw the brokenness of his originally good creation um the the dis-ease within that creation and decided to do something about it to intervene to mend to heal to make healthy again and so um what we remember around this time of year the incarnation the word became flesh and made his tent among us. So God took on human flesh and walked the earth. Um, and of course, he he was born as as a as a child, as a baby, as a as babies are born. He lived, he grew up, he taught. Of course, he died a sacrificial death and then rose again three days later. Okay, this gospel story we believe is for all peoples and cultures, and therefore can be represented by all peoples and cultures. So um, the First Nations version of John 3.16 reads, the great spirit loves this world of human beings so deeply. He gave us his son, the only son who fully represents him. All who trust in him and his way will not come to a bad end, but will have the life of the world to come that never fades away, full of beauty and harmony. All who trust in him, right? This gospel is for the entire world for all peoples and cultures and so it can be represented that way so we can we can see representations artistic representations um of um of the of the bible story and these are this is not exhaustive by the way this is just representative so this is a, a piece of art um from the yoruba peoples that um depicts the transfiguration within their cultural context. Right. 
so we can we can see these things here's one i i stumbled across just a couple days ago that i think is very poignant the image of christ as the good shepherd um but as an african american man right um, just a beautiful image this is the crucifixion um but it's represented in the form of one of the aboriginal tribes of australia um, and so that's the artistic flavor the rock in the background is one of their sacred sites and so they depict the crucifixion as happening outside of that sacred site of course this is very common um, there have been I, I heard two figures either hundreds of millions or billions of this image um, reprinted and distributed around the world probably one of the most famous images of christ not pale skin blue eyed but still uh very uh very euro-american in its depiction um, and then there's this one that i love which is depiction of jesus as a maori man with the the uh the the face tattoos and and everything um, i just love love this image it's a different take on that head of christ image um, and this is the last one, Father John Giuliani, who his Lakota Trinity is the book cover for Richard Twist's Rescuing the Gospel from the Cowboys. Um, this is one of his works as well, The Compassionate Christ, um, and uh, just, just very poignant. Uh, but the gospel story is for all of us, and therefore all of our artistic representations can, can bear. Um, the the image of these stories and and of christ in a cultural form that we identify with and that's that's great that that is the universal aspect of the christian faith right but when we talk about the gospel we also have to talk about the fact that the events of the christ story to did take place within a specific cultural context that is with certain cultural coordinates is the word I would use, uh, the term I would use, just like coordinates on a map tell you where you are in the world. Um, and a timeline can tell you when you are. If you put those together, I would love to see maps that have both time and space depicted so it tells you where you are and when you are at the same time. Um, everybody has cultural coordinates. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania. So I am a uh, white Anglo-Saxon male who was born in late 20th century Pennsylvania. That, those are my cultural coordinates. Um, and people from that area will have more intimate knowledge about what those cultural coordinates, the specifics of those cultural coordinates. So for instance, you grew up in Myerstown, you know it is very mono-ethnic or had been at the time of my growing up, uh, slowly becoming, very slowly becoming more diverse. Um, but ethnically very, very uh, homogenous, very much the same. But those are my cultural coordinates. Um, what are the cultural coordinates of the Christ story? That's, that's the, the wrestling point of, of the incarnation. When we read the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, it's, it's a story that appeals and applies to, to all people groups that we can depict in a variety of ways. But the historical occurrence did take place within specific cultural coordinates. And those cultural coordinates are um, Jesus was born and lived as a first century Palestinian Jewish man. Right? That's very specific cultural coordinates. He did not look like me. And that's part of the, the mainstream culture in America. Their wrestling has been with this. Um, with, with that exact truth, that Jesus was not born, did not live as an Anglo-European man, right, in the 14th, 15th, 16th century, even though we have paintings depicting him as such. And in fact, the medium of, uh, of the last century that we've depicted the, the gospel story in has been film and television, right? Um, and I'm the kind of guy that I notice I notice these things. How are these representations done? What, what are we saying um, when these representations are put together? 
Um, so I, I put together a few slides of pictures of um, actors who have, betra uh, have portrayed Jesus um, in, in the course of the last, we'll say, 60 years specifically. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but just as an illustration of how mainstream American culture has struggled with this concept of the cultural coordinates of Jesus. Um, I start by these, these first two are ones that I remember my mother having on videotape, not, not DVR, videotape, back when you had to put a videotape and a VCR and then set the time to record it off the TV. That's, that's what she did. She had those, these first two movies on there. First one was, was King of Kings, it's 1961. Notice the, the pale skin, blue eyed Jesus, right? Very much. Uh, Jeffrey Hunter is the name of the actor, by the way, um, I'm just showing these to you. There's, there's no commentary on the theology of the movies other than their depictions of Jesus. Um, it's just, I just find these interesting as symbols of how mainstream American culture is comfortable depicting Jesus. So Jeffrey Hunter in King of Kings, 1961. Max von Sydow in The Greatest Story Ever, ever Told. About four years later, these were for years, like the um, the gold standard for depictions of Jesus, um, Max von Sydow is very famous for other roles, um, but he did play Jesus in this movie. Uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, if anybody is a musical fan, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yes, yeah, Preston, I see you waving down there. So Ted Neely played him again, pale-faced, very light-eyed, Jesus in Jesus Christ Superstar. And then this Robert Powell, um, for a generation of people, when they thought about Jesus, a uh, depiction of Jesus on television, this is who they thought of. That includes me. I remember growing up, it was an event where every year around Easter time, they would show Jesus of Nazareth as a two part miniseries. And this was on broadcast television on CBS. And can you imagine that happening today? I, I don't think they would do it today, but they, they used to for, for a number of years growing up. This was the, this was the gold standard, right? Um, so Robert Powell's the one who played Jesus in that miniseries. The Jesus film, which has been translated into dozens of different languages and shown around the world, stories are told about missionaries taking copies of the Jesus film deep into the jungle to show to indigenous people groups. Brian Deacon is the Jesus in the Jesus film. Okay, um, in this particular picture, he, he has this like glowing aura, very much like. Um, renaissance era or late renaissance era paintings depictions of, of jesus um, and then we skip some years and here's the last temptation of christ very controversial film willem dafoe who is another very famous actor he plays jesus in this one again very very pale skin light-eyed jesus uh, bruce marciano and a bruce marciano's mother was syrian so um, he, he has the Middle Eastern, he's got some of the Middle Eastern look, um, but uh, yeah, this is the visual Bible, which was not widely circulated. Uh, you might have caught it on, on the Catholic um, news channel, EWTN. They, they occasionally play it. And then we, we're just going to roll through these. Jeremy Sisto played Jesus. Christian Bale played Jesus. Yes, Batman played Jesus um, before he played Batman, um, which is very interesting. Uh, this guy, I, I do appreciate the Gospel of John as a movie that actually follows the Living Bible's script for the Gospel of John word for word. Um, the Jesus depicted in it is Henry Ian Cusick, who is known for starring in the TV show Lost, um, who was actually born in Peru. Um, so this is something very interesting starts to happen. Of course, in 2001, 9-11 happens and the Middle Eastern body becomes vilified, right? Um, these are the, the 
the peoples who are put in uh, com into Guantanamo Bay, into the, the interrogation camps, interrogation cells. Um, the Middle Eastern body becomes associated with terrorism, right? Uh, and so this is just, just two years after 9-11, you have the, the Gospel of John. And then, of course, we have the Passion of the Christ. Jim Caviezel, who um, is, is not Middle Eastern of any kind. In fact, in order to play Jesus, he had a prosthetic nose. And his eyes were digitally colored to look brown because he's got, he's got gray eyes, light blue eyes. Um, something interesting happens in the Passion of the Christ, because if you've seen it, you know that it is all in Aramaic and Latin. And so for the first time in a mass audience, we get the actual name of Jesus as it would have been spoken in first century Palestine, heard on screen. So Yeshua bin Nazareth HaMashiach, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, but we hear it for the first time in a mass audience in Aramaic. Right? And of course, we could go into a whole separate conversation about where did we get the word Jesus from, right? Yeshua, if we were to, to put Yeshua and just translate it straight from Aramaic into English would, would translate into Joshua, but we get Jesus because the Aramaic went through the Greek, went through the Latin, eventually winding up in English as Jesus Christ. Right? Um, and that's significant because again, it, we're, we're mainstream American culture was wrestling through um, this, this idea of how, we, how, how do we talk about and depict Jesus while at the same time struggling with um, internal feelings, negative feelings towards Middle Eastern bodies, right? Um, some years later, um, we now, we're now 13 years removed from 9-11, so we kind of start to see this, what might be called ethnically neutral, Jesus, not quite Middle Eastern yet, but we're getting away from the pale skin, uh, blue eyes, and the actors who need to be make up a certain way and digitally altered in a certain way to look more like they belong to the cultural coordinates of Jesus. Ewan McGregor, I don't know why he was depicted as Jesus, as Jesus, other than the fact that people had already mistook him for Jesus when he played Obi Wan Kenobi. That is. That is Obi-Wan Kenobi, that's not Jesus, although he's been mistaken for Jesus. Uh, that's, that's a joke, if you've seen the memes. Um, Selva Roslingham has the distinction of being the only actor to play Jesus in uh, a depiction of all four gospels, right? Um, we're getting closer to um, a depiction of Jesus that actually fits the cultural coordinates. And we actually landed there 2015. I don't know if you remember this. I think it was on one of the, the NBC channels, Killing Jesus, which has some dubious, questionable the theological um, principles in it. But for the first time on network TV, we have a Middle Eastern man playing Jesus. And these are, this is not an exhaustive list. So there might be others that I'm missing. But I'm, I'm thinking about the ones that had the widest audiences among mainstream American um, culture. Um, so this gentleman um, was born in Lebanon, the country. Um, I believe he's actually a Muslim man playing Jesus. Right? And I remember I was pastoring. I was a congregational leader when this show came out. Um, and actually celebrated the fact that finally we get a Middle Eastern Jesus on the screen, right? Hey, Gene. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you can see this well. Oh, yeah. Right there. Everybody. That guy. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I thought you would be coming up. Yep. Avraham is actually, was actually born in northern Israel and played Jesus Christ in the shack in 2017. Finally in 2017. So... 1961 was the first movie I, I showed, 2017. So 50 years it took us to get a Jesus on screen that fit the cultural coordinates of the historical Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, oh, oh, I forgot Cliff Curtis. Cliff Curtis is actually 
So I can go back. Cliff Curtis is actually of uh, is Maori, right? And he played Jesus in Risen, which is a great movie. I appreciate it. And then, of course, the most recent one is Jonathan Rumi and The Chosen. The Chosen does something very interesting in the fact that most of the white actors in The Chosen portray Roman soldiers. Now think about that for a second. And if you are familiar with the concepts of colonization, um, the idea that a TV series would, do, would put white actors in the role of the colonizers of Jesus' day is very significant. So thanks for bearing with me on that, that little journey. But these are the thoughts that, that come through as I went on my own journey um, and knowing that, you know, growing up in the church and uh, being familiar with scripture and, and Christian principles, but still at the same time needing a savior. Um, and that's, that's a, a very important distinction to make because there, there are many people who grew up in the church who, who don't recognize the need for a savior. Um, and um, I, I was brought to that knowledge. And so for me, um, part of encountering Jesus and remembering what his cultural coordinates were is to remember that when it comes to, to Christ, I am the outsider who is welcomed in. I'm not the insider who has a right to the gospel. And that's a shift in, in, in a way of thinking um, that, that still needs to happen. Uh, among some uh, Western evangelical Protestant Christians, that you don't have a right to the gospel. You are an outsider invited in because of what Christ has done, because of what a brown-skinned first-century Palestinian Jewish man who is God in the flesh did, right? Um, and so just want to finish up by again, saying that, you know, the, the cultural coordinates of Jesus are very important. And as we celebrate Christmas and celebrate the incarnation, um, it is, is especially important um, for me to remember. Um, I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm preaching to you because really I'm preaching to me. And when I think about the work that um, the Lord uh, has me doing here um, in the Southwest United States, I'm also simultaneously thinking, how will I represent that work to the people in the land of ghosts back in southeastern Pennsylvania? Uh, and uh, you can pray for me on on that, um, because that's a that's a uh, that's a that's a struggle for me. That's one of those wrestling points where I say, how do I how do I share what I'm learning and what I have learned with people? Um, who I know, um, who may or may not uh, recognize the, the cultural coordinates of Christ alongside of, and that's the thing, those are not opposed, the fact that the gospel is for everyone, but that the gospel story, the Christ story took place with, within certain cultural coordinates, those are not opposed to each other, they belong together. And um, so uh, that's what was on my heart to share for this evening. Very cool. Speaking my language, you know, I've been at this now for 31 years, and I I came with that that idea that you're coming to right now, 30 31 years ago, and even a few years before that, when I was developing, like, can I really do this? Is this really possible? How could Jesus have been presented to me in this white model all these years? And then finally breaking away and then seeing it and then developing a theology that totally does what you're trying to do, show people that is. Uh, someone said one time, uh, I think I seen it in a meme. Uh, they, they said, there are no white people in the Bible. Hmm. Uh, not until you get over to Europe and Paul goes over to the, but they're still pretty dark there in the Mediterranean though, until you get up and to the uh, Scandinavian areas. How about it, anybody? Uh, questions for him and comments?
Just raise your hand and go ahead. <clears throat> it's me. One thing uh, I'd be interested to hear you dig into a little bit more is, and you know, you kind of started talking about uh, scriptural context and contextual theology versus systematic theology. Um, and in my experience, I've seen systematic theology get so hyper focused that it really loses like all the hermeneutics and it really loses all the the context and that then leads to really poor theology because you you have pretty dramatic misreadings of the scripture because the the focus is so sharp um, and that you you lose all the all the context and I think what you were talking about with um, like these scriptures really coming from uh, cultures that emphasized um, oral history that um, in, the, in the same manner, a lot of that gets lost because the way you communicate orally um, is your stories are very different than if you're if you're communicating in the written word and you know it's only going to be the, the written word. Um, and I think like Paul in particular, I think is really, uh, misunderstood because of those, those two things. Um, and I think a lot of times you've seen in the church building dogma off of things that Paul wrote that actually are pretty much the opposite of what he was trying to accomplish when you really look at the context and that kind of thing. But I don't know, I'm just wondering, like, what are some of the things that you've seen and your journey kind of from systematic theology to contextual theology, have there been any things that have really stood out to you that like, wow, this really put this idea in a completely new way for me um, because of understanding it more in a holistic manner and it's in its full kind of thing. Yeah. Um, thanks for your question, Brian. Um, systematic theology, again, I, th there are utilities to it. But it is dangerous because, as you said, you know, they, to try and put a fine point on the topic, you almost have to decontextualize it. So you're taking it out of its context. And the more you take it out of its context, the further away you get from the original context in which it was delivered, right? Um, and so um, there is one, one, one in, interpretation of the triumphal entry that I was presented in my doctoral studies I'd never thought about before, um, but um, that, that got me to thinking. And that was um, the idea of Jesus in the triumphal entry entering through the sheep gate. The sheep gate is where the sheep for the sacrifice were, were, were herded in, right? Um, because the triumphal entry happened around the time of Passover and Jesus entered into that gate. And so first of all, there's a symbolism there that Jesus is entering in through the sheep gate right? This kind of prefiguring the sacrifice, him as the Lamb of God. Um, but then that also gives a different take on why everybody laid their palm branches and their, um, and their coats down. Because if you have a herd of animals in one area, what are you going to have on the ground, right? Um, so uh, as part of the, the, yes, honoring Jesus, but also covering up some of the, uh, some of the, the sheep stuff, um, as Jesus is entering through the sheep gate. Those are the kinds of details that um, if we're to take the triumphal entry out of its cultural context and historical context, you, we lose, right? But it makes it so much rich because richer when we understand because it, it's putting it in its place and its cultural place. Uh, and, and of course you, you regain some of that symbolism, so. Yeah, on, on that too, didn't they actually, uh, they said they laid palm branches, but also they laid their cloaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really sacrificing and honoring in a way. It's like taking off this and laying it on the ground so that, you know, not even the, you know, the mule would uh, step on it. Mm -hmm. Other comments?
Well, Gene and I, we sat just outside my teepee uh, a while back. I made a trip over to Flagstaff, uh, Laura and I, and uh, during that time, I had a chance to meet up with Gene uh, while he was still employed at the Indian Bible College. And uh, Laura and I stayed in a, a luxury teepee. It had uh, bunk beds, light, heater, uh, Wi-Fi, and everything in this teepee. And Gene showed up and I thought, man, I told him, I says, if this is teepee life, uh, I just may do it. <laughs> so, so we we sat and that first that was our first discussion about uh, contextual ministry at that time. And, and uh, I don't know what you thought about it then, but you know, I I've been kicking these things around for a long time, and instead of I've been doing theology on the ground, making it happen rather than uh, you know leaving it to the ivory tower. So that's most of what my degree is my being a missiologist. Uh, I'm more practical. I try to I say let let's take it out of the ivory tower and let's do it. And let's make it happen down here. That's, that's what I, I like to do, to show that uh, we're every culture. All right, uh, Diane. Yeah, um, this is just a small thing, I think, with you talking about the different ways that um, Jesus has been depicted in film. And then you're talking about the triumphal entry. I, it started coming to my mind anytime I've ever seen that in a film. It's on a nice, clean dirt path, you know. It was just kind of interesting to me that it's never been shown the way it probably was in context, quite filthy and smelly. Mm -hmm. So just a little note there. Yeah. That's all. No question. Even the birth, very, very smelly there too. Yeah. In the, oh, yeah. 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 Preston, did you raise your hand? Uh, yeah. First, um, when I was uh, yesterday, the Bible app did bring up uh, John three sixteen, and the speaker did bring up that uh, when the original context of love was so broad, it was the, it was the first time in the Bible where this version of love was used. The version of love is used is a possessive and a more like inclusive love where it's an authoritative or like taking over, not having control, but having a, a hold onto of someone. That's how much you love them. I mean, that's what the speaker was about. I don't remember the name of the speaker, but it was just like so empowerful that how much that word was meant and is even with our oral history and our stories as native people that we know what words we need to know and how powerful a single word like that can be so work can help us and have you ever gone stumbled upon something like that and how it can help the native people to use that word of love and second of all is um according to your list of people you forgot one person again mm -hmm. which is going back on to the theater side my love the musical theater is john legend john legend did oh, play yeah. jesus too yeah that was in the uh the newer uh tv version of jesus christ superstar is that right he played yes that? yes yeah yeah yes you're right thank you um yeah um one of the things one of the classes i taught at indian bible college was advanced bible study methods and so there were a few things that i i wanted to make sure i i communicated very clearly to the students one was that the bible is not a piece of western literature and the second is that english actually in in some ways fails utterly to capture certain biblical concepts um, and in order to recapture the fullness of a contextual understanding of those concepts, you actually need to go back to the, the Greek word or the Hebrew word 
Um, and, and love is one of those examples. Love is such a general term, the way it's used in English. Um, and actually, um, the Bible project just, just did a very, very, a very good video explaining how, how the term love, it, it doesn't, it doesn't have enough nuance, uh, for capturing certain scripture passages. Um, you know, the, you say you love your mom and you love pizza, um, you know, just that, that little example, um, you're using the same term, obviously, uh, you don't mean the same thing, or at least hope, hopefully not. Um, but in, in terms of scripture, um, in the Greek, there are multiple terms used for love, for, for specific purposes, right? And agape being that, that one example. Um, and, you know, how is how is agape itself defined? And that's, when when you insert agape into for instance the love chapter in first corinthians 13 it there's a there's a depth like that entire chapter then becomes almost a definition of what agape looks like um and so that's that's one of the examples we use and i also kind of i remind i i've i had to remind my students when i bring that up that first corinthians 13 is not part of a marriage ceremony within scripture but as part of a letter to the church. So not only is 1 Corinthians 13 an extended definition of what agape means, it's how agape is supposed to be lived within the sacred family. So yeah, um, so that's, that's one of those things just to, to kind of elaborate on the example you gave, Preston, that, that I've, I've learned and I've tried to pass on. Go ahead, Kimberly. Uh, more of a comment of sorts. Um, I have a friend who, when she is talking to people about Jesus, instead of her telling them how she knows Jesus, she asks them what they think, you know. Um, for instance, if someone were to say to her, you know, there is no Jesus, you know, that's all just made up. And she would just look at them, you know, and say, well, how, you know, how have you come to believe that? You know, tell me more about that. And it opens up conversations because it's so accepting of her to not shut the person down. And to me, that always demonstrated love. And it always demonstrated that the person who thinks they're evangelizing to someone else, doesn't have to have all the answers, doesn't have to know everything. In fact, we can't know everything. And it's, it's, we get into trouble when we think we do, when we think we know more than the unchurched person or the unsaved person. And that's just not even how it's supposed to work. And I always have to wonder, you know, um, what Jesus thinks about, you know, what does he look like? And, and he sees all the depictions of him. The other day I was watching Evan Almighty. <laughs> and I hadn't seen that one in a while. But it was just like, oh, man, that's just something else. So I think um, there are some things that are always going to be mysteries. And, and trying to make them not so is, is akin to a dog chasing his tail. You know, and I think with indigenous people, um, and I don't want to make a blanket statement, what I have noticed when I talk to other indigenous people is that uh, they don't have to know all the answers, <laughs> but they are watching Christian behavior and seeing if their actions match up with their words. And when they don't, that's not a surprise. And when they do, then some really good things can happen. So that's what I was thinking of when I was listening to um, those comments. And I agree with you on um, the love scriptures. Uh, they use them for weddings, yes, but it's, there's just so much more depth that teaches us how we should behave as human beings to each other. You know, so. And then the other comment that I was thinking about was um, the red letter Bibles. 
You know, I always got to kind of laugh a little bit about those because there are some people who, you know, they're like, these are the words that Jesus said, the ones that are in the red letters. You know, everything else is, has nothing to do with them is the unspoken, <laughs> it's the unspoken thing. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's kind of um, interesting listening to and watching other people and learning about how they came to think what they what they do. And that's what we're supposed to do. You know, that's what Jesus did. He met people where they where they were. You know, not where he thought they should be, not where he knew they were going to be. It didn't work that way. And he was accepted no matter, you know, no matter what for those, for the woman at the well, you know, or um, with the tax collectors and things like that. So I think those are just such important things that modern day contemporary evangelical Christians may forget. My son and his girlfriend went to a gun show over the weekend. And, you know, I'm sure everybody's going to, you know, <laughs> people are going to be going, oh. but um, somebody was there handing out religious tracts. And the person on the front of the tract was supposed to be Jesus on a white horse. But the way the graphics were done, it looked like, um, like an avatar from a video game. And then all the bottom of the image was pools of blood, you know, for the Armageddon. And my sister's girl, or my brother's, sorry, my son's girlfriend is not saved. And so she brought this home and she said, what do you think about this? And I don't, I don't, I don't think people really think when they're handing out tracts sometime how much damage they can do. And then on the other side of it were all these different words that'll mean, they'll be meaningful to believers in Jesus, but they won't be meaningful to people who don't believe in Jesus. And that's a biblical. They're, they're, people that don't believe in Jesus are not going to understand some of the language that believers do until the Holy Spirit comes upon them and there's illumination or revelation. So um, it's just very interesting, all the different methods that are tried on people and what, what they actually do, you know, because if they're not working, then they're having the opposite effect on people. And that's, that's sad when you think about it. All right, those are all the comments I was thinking about as I was listening to your presentations and looking at all those images and things like that. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Good words. Mm -hmm. Your your comments made me think of, and I, I forgot to mention this um, when I was talking about um, just finding out that that Christianity still among a lot, many Native Americans is considered the white man's religion. Um, if anybody's watched Reservation Dogs, um, where there's there's twice in that series two different characters look at a depiction of Jesus and say, how's it going, white Jesus? And I thought, well, how fitting, you know, how fitting that is. I'm sure that that's, that's the image. That's the idea. Uh, and uh, for some people. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I, have, I got one image. I sent, I sent it to you, uh, Gene, but uh, I found this image in, in Michigan. Somebody had uh, uh, taken that classic uh, image of Jesus and decorated it and um, see if I can show this good enough on the screen there. Oh yeah. Put a headband and a feather and some beadwork on his yeah. on his side. So they just doctored that up to me. So then they say, now this is a native Jesus. They're trying to trying to make the white image of Jesus into something that they can connect with. And this was a good start for somebody to see that yes it does go that way yeah it, it's just wanted to share that with you and with you all to see that that image any other questions and comments is a very good very good yeah. well i think i thought of casey when you showed that image was isn't that how so much of evangelism to natives that tries to be culturally 
sensitive ends up being, where they just take the white Christianity and let's just throw a little beadwork on it, and then it's all good. And and now you should be able to like understand it <laughs> instead of really like let's find a really authentic native expression rather than just dressing up our our white stuff to to try to like pass it off as being native. Yeah, if I had somebody say that, yeah, your Jesus is just beadwork and feathers. It's it. You know, no, it isn't. It's way deeper than that. It's 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 in your context of who who we are. It's in that you know that coordinates that we are. That Jesus, we can connect with Jesus, who was this human being that came and taber tabernacled with us. And Richard used to say he he put up his teepee in our village and lived with us. Other comments? Very good stuff. Well, Gene, you got all of us to to work with here and. And throw your ideas out there. Maybe another time we can have you on again. I really appreciate your, you know, getting to know you. And you know, you're you're one of a, you know, a dozen people that are walking that same path that you are. That I have connections with, trying to help them navigate through their this the, this white theology that they've been given and you know really forced forced in, force fed, and not given any other direction beside that uh, I even think of the Bible uh, the King James Version was written by white folks in a King James English so that white people could understand it and um, and when it came to the Native American people like like we don't we don't speak uh, King James English and then when the new First Nations Version comes out that is like wow this this is what really connects with me and I can imagine when the first King James Version come out, they really thought, wow, this really connects with me. The Hebrew and Greek don't, but this does. So it was contextualized for the people at the time. And Terry Wildman has contextualized it for the people of this time. And I believe it's gonna really make a, a big impact. And we're really looking forward to spreading, spreading the word by handing uh, this Bible out to many folks in the future. You guys got another song, do you? Yeah, we're going to keep with the tradition of uh, having our, our closing round dance. So even though we're not gathering together yet, uh, we're still going to have a virtual closing round dance. So uh, we would encourage you to uh, round dance in your spirit. And if you're in a space where you can round dance physically uh, with us, we would encourage you to do that as well. And we'll just go through it one time.
Mm -hmm. All right, well, uh, that's something to really take serious, uh, this round dance, because um, when we do start meeting together, we are going to do a round dance. We are going to, uh, when Jonathan and I travel and we do ministry at different, different locations, uh, when he asked me to dance and he'll ask me to lead a round dance, he'll, we got a song that uh, he sings that has that beat to it. And we'll go a long time. We'll go like 10 push-ups on that or, or verses we call it. And he'll go long and we'll get everybody involved. I remember one time when we were at, in uh, Ireland, we were at a YWAM base and when that song came up, everybody just was off their feet. They were like, Re we're ready to go. So what we do is we all kind of hold hands. Uh, they all follow me and we, we travel around in a circle. Uh, we swing our hands back and forth. Uh, and then I'll lead them in, in like a single file. We'll go out a door, come in a door, we'll go around the, uh, around the chairs. We'll make a giant circle. Uh, and then we'll do a coiling, a coiling where we'll I'll coil us all down into a, a real tight circle. And then everybody almost gets really nervous because what are we going to do now? And then I twist and I turn around and I coil back out again and, and carry them out. And, uh, and then in the end, we make one giant circle and, and then do a, a closing so can't wait till those days come and we can do this in a big, big venue with many people. So waiting for those days. I know Jonathan is too. So get ready, practice. If you need to go on to the internet and look at uh, how to do a round dance. It's, uh, I don't know if it's natural for some native people, but when I see a lot of white people coming out there, I, I try not to laugh. It just comes out. So come out and try to practice it a little bit so that when you come out, you'll, you'll feel natural out there and it'll, it'll feel good. And, uh, and I know Jonathan has some uh, other songs, some two-step songs. We can have a good time. Well, thank you again, Jean. You're, you're a blessing to me. I look forward to working with you and, and Kimberly, and all work, working with you to make this happen and see your work out there and help change the minds of many people to see that uh, the expressions of Jesus need to be shown in a native way if we're ever going to make the gospel known among Native American people. So as I close us with prayer, Father, we thank you so much for this evening, getting a little deep in the theological understanding. I believe that's the meat that we all can understand now we're way beyond the milk of the word. And many of us need this meat in order to understand deeper into the contextual understanding that's out there. I pray for each one of them as they grow in their knowledge and, and in their ministries, wherever they are, that they can reach out and know that this kind of ministry needs to take place to heal the many wounds that are in our native people and in our land. I pray that through Gene's efforts and many others who are studying and working hard for Native ministries that we continue this path to break down the barriers and heal the wounds and bring God's love to the world in a new way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's been a great evening. Uh, if you, uh, Gene does have uh, an email. I believe he's also on uh, Facebook there. You can connect with him, direct message him if you have any other questions. Uh, keep him in prayer. I know he's still uh, doing many other things, uh, especially working on his uh, THD. Uh, and someday all of you will be there working on your THD as well. So we look forward to the younger people getting up there and making us proud and giving us that understanding. So. As we go, thank you so much for joining us again here in Albuquerque, New Mexico on Good Medicine Way. We'll see you in a couple of weeks now. So enjoy your time with the, the talking circles that we're having and sharing. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll be back again. Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful 
Christmas and Happy New Year. Be careful out there. Wear your, wear your mask, take it seriously. Ask people to wear their mask. I don't know what this is, but when people wear it on their top lip, just ignorance. It doesn't do any good unless it's on top of your nose. So I get that in the gym sometimes. People always wearing their mask below their nose. Well, that's just my comment. <laughs> Take care, everyone, and have a wonderful uh, holiday season. Bye-bye. Love you all.